Ladies and gentlemen, this is a warning. Thank you. Tinicum Marsh is no stranger being a dumping ground. Back in 1904, two boys walking near where a man's burned skeleton was found spotted something bobbing in the water. It turned out to be a woman stuffed into a bag. Back in the early years of America, the local Native Americans referred to the 5,000 acre swampland as Islands of the Marsh. As Europeans settled in the area and the city of Philadelphia grew, that swampland gradually dwindled to just 200 acres by the 1950s. Locals were able to petition to reroute the construction of Interstate 95, which would have cut right through the marsh, and in 1972, the Tinicum National Environmental Center was established to protect the swampland, and 235 acres north of I-95 were immediately returned into restricted land. That size was scheduled to double in 1976, but many locals still used the excluded area to hunt and play. As the saying goes, this is why we can't have nice things, and almost immediately the marsh earned a reputation where stolen vehicles and bodies could be discreetly dumped. While locals would state this phenomena was nothing new, it seems the press about the new preserve only put the idea into more killers' heads, and a decade before the Frankfurt slasher would prowl the streets of northern Philadelphia, a string of young women would be abducted and later turn up in the swamp. The women were all known to travel in the same circles and were connected to a local biker gang, but apart from one killing, none of the Tinicum Marsh murders has ever been solved. goes on in San Francisco for the man known as the Zodiac Killer. There could be a serial killer in Chicago. The Oakland County child killer. Phantom killer. Frankfurt slasher. Four children have now been murdered. Has killed five and says he's going to kill again. Fifteen brutally murdered young women. The pattern is the same. One by one, the death count started rising. A man in a mask robbed, tied, and stabbed them. Strangled, stuffed in burlap bags. It is highly unlikely that these women were murdered by separate men. Where will the killer strike next? The police can't answer who or why. That's the question that we'll never know. I don't want to live the rest of my life wondering if this person's going to be caught. I believe that there's someone out there that has knowledge. And he's probably still at large. The Warlocks Motorcycle Club is one of two gangs sharing the same name and both formed in 1967. The first outlaw MC group formed in Pennsylvania and would rapidly grow with the influx of returning Vietnam vets in the 70s, just as the drug culture began to form. The carefree lifestyle of drugs and partying would attract many of Philadelphia's rebellious youth. But it wasn't all parties. Gang violence would regularly erupt as MCs entered crime for profit with drug trafficking, arms dealing, and prostitution. It is in this climate that Philadelphia Community College student Elizabeth Land began dating warlock biker Thomas Naus Jr. The former beauty queen lived at 7651 Overbrook Avenue. And despite warnings from her friends, Liz went to his apartment in Folcroft on December 21st, 1971, where they did drugs. At some point, after she playfully kicked him, Thomas got mad and strangled her into unconsciousness. After she woke, she locked herself in the bathroom, but he persuaded her to come out. They had sex again, but Liz later told them she was breaking up with him. In response, Naus hit her with a board and hung her from the rafters. The next morning, he forced his neighbor, William Standen, to take the body to a garage in Upper Darby, where John Weir burned all her belongings. Next, they drove to a wooded area near Williamstown, New Jersey, and buried the body. Naus was an immediate suspect, and even bragged about the murder, saying he later moved the body as well as removing her teeth and hands. 
Finally, in July 1977, Stanton would confess to his part and Nouse would be sentenced to life in prison despite her body never being found. Though Elizabeth's murder would be solved, Thomas Nouse and the Warlocks would have six years before their deeds went punished, and it is during this period that had more girls associated with them went missing. 15-year-old Mary Ann Lees and 16-year-old Lane Dorothy Spicer were 10th graders at Upper Darby High School. Mary lived at 6921 Clinton Road and Spicer just across the street at 6922 Clinton in the Upper Darby neighborhood of West Philadelphia. The two friends were last seen leaving their homes on Thursday, March 27, 1975 to spend the night in another girl's home near Westchester Pike and Carroll Boulevard about a two-mile walk from their houses. When neither had returned home the following morning, their mothers reported them missing. Police would ascertain that the two had left their friend's home around 11.30 p.m. Thursday night. It was 2.30 Monday afternoon when a man repairing the outside of Jerry's Corner Market just below the Passyunk Bridge noticed something bobbing in the water on the western bank of the Schuylkill River. A responding fireboat would also find the second body in the waters nearby. Due to the cold temperature of the water, the date of their deaths could not be determined, but autopsies would show both had been shot multiple times to the head by a small caliber gun. Neither girl had been molested. A reward of $5,000 was put up and police received a number of tips, but nothing came of it. It was May 10th of that year when 17-year-old high school dropout Denise Seaman left her home at 440 South 5th Street to meet her boyfriend at the McDade Mall. She never made it. The mall will feature prominently in our story, so let's take a brief look at its history. Opening in 1969 with just five shops, the mall would blow up to have over 35 stores in the 80s. Younger viewers may not know, but back in the day, mall culture rang supreme as the place to hang out. When I-476 opened up, locals now had easy access to larger malls elsewhere and McDade began to struggle. By the mid-2000s, much of the mall was vacant and has since been converted into the strip mall scene here. Back to 1975. While police were still searching for Denise, it was now midnight on Friday, August 16th when 20-year-old Deborah Delosier was leaving a friend's home on McDade Boulevard to make the short walk back to her home at 87 Upland Terrace. Police immediately made a search of their neighborhood and did not believe her to be a runaway, as she had a family trip to Tennessee planned for that weekend which she was excited to go on, and already had her bags packed. The following week, an anonymous letter arrived to her parents. It stated that Deborah was killed because she knew too much, and that could be damaging to a lot of people. The writers said they would tell them where to find their girl, but that information never came. Meanwhile, the police investigation was uncovering some startling facts. The four high school girls were all known to have been at the same friend group that hung out at the McDade Mall and were known to have been involved with the Warlocks MC who used the mall as an area to deal drugs. By the end of the summer, the mall was known as being like an armed camp with police patrols, security guards, and undercover officers. Before moving to Colwyn in January, Denise Seaman had lived on Guilford Road, just a block away from Lees and Spicer. It is at this time they also announced Elizabeth Land's disappearance as connected. There were now two girls dead and three missing. We now return to Tinicum Marsh. It was October 17th that year when authorities found a man who had died of natural causes in the marsh. That same day, five duck hunters would stumble upon a skeleton. A class ring with the initials DMS would identify it as the body of Denise Seaman. Her jaw had been broken and she had been shot twice in the head. Less than a week later, half a mile down the road, another two bodies were found as a result of a murder-suicide. Then, in November, a policeman patrolling trainer, an industrial borough downriver, found 15-year-old Susan Jameson underneath a truck trailer. 
he managed to cut the cord off her neck before she suffocated to death. The girl had gone missing two days earlier and was a known acquaintance of the McDade Mall group. In fact, back in May when Denise went missing, Susan was found wandering the Marcus Hook neighborhood in a daze. She told a story about being abducted from the McDade Mall, drugged, raped, and finally dumped underneath the 12th Street Bridge. Susan only lived three doors down from Denise and stated that she had witnessed the Lees and Spicer murders. The investigation finally had a break. Except it didn't. Susan's parents told police the girl had a history of emotional problems. She could provide no information on her abduction, and worst of all, later admitted to making up that she had witnessed the murders. Police discounted her completely, stating she was a pathological liar. It was January 17, 1976, when two rabbit hunters would find the skeleton of Deborah DeLozier a mile and a half away from where Denise Seaman had been found. Like Denise, her jaw was broken and her skull had been shattered by bullets. That same month, five Warlock members would be arrested for the death of six-year-old Ann Morrow after she was killed in a shootout between the bikers and her father, Joseph Chicky Morrow. Eleven months after Deborah was found, a lawyer named C. William Kraft and two associates went to this house to meet William Schaefer after he phoned saying he had information on the murdered girls in the marsh. They would later state Schaefer was acting irrationally and after speaking for an hour, he left to go out to his car in the driveway and would return with a black bag that he said had evidence in it. After dumping it on the table, Schaefer grabbed a rifle and loaded it. The men struggled and Kraft ended up shooting him in the chest. Kraft would later be acquitted of the shooting, but more interestingly, just two days after Thomas Naus was arrested for Elizabeth Land's disappearance, Willem Schaefer was found dead via suicide by taping a vacuum cleaner hose from his exhaust into his car. Police noted Schaefer had a history of drug abuse and were investigating the suicide in relation to the Warlocks. The task force for the Tinicum Marsh murders was formed in February 1976 and would make a startling announcement. They believed there was many as seven linked murders. Originally believed to have been suicide, 23-year-old Joseph Milano was found dead of a gunshot wound to the head in his apartment block at 140 Seminole Avenue in Norwood on January 20th, 1975. And then, on March 6, his sister was also found dead of an apparent self-inflicted gunshot to the head in the same apartment. On May 30th, Maria Milano's best friend, Doris Givens, told her mother she believed Maria had been murdered. One day later, she allegedly shot herself in the head at a friend's house at 4690 State Road in Upper Darby. She lingered unconscious in the hospital for four days before dying. The two girls had left suicide notes, describing themselves as emotionally troubled drug users. But when their cases were reopened in April the following year, police stated these deaths were linked to the Warlocks. There are also several other murders that were not stated as linked, but occurred during the same time period and have enough similarities to earn a mention. First is the disappearance of 15-year-old Wendy Eaton on May 17, 1975, which at the time was included as believed linked. Last seen just after 3 p.m. walking at the intersection of Indian Lane and Media Station Road, she had told a friend she was going to head into town to purchase a gift for her brother. Wendy was regarded as a good student and devoutly religious. She had choir rehearsal that night and her parents said she would absolutely not miss that, but they did not deny the possibility Wendy could have joined a religious cult named the Forever Family that resided in nearby Luzerne County. A man named William C. Richardson and an unnamed 17-year-old boy were both arrested for attempting to extort $10,000 ransom money, but were both proven to not be actually involved with the disappearance. In 2021, police searched the wooded property behind a house near the intersection and stated they were now treating the case as a homicide, but would not specify if the people who owned the property at the time were suspects or why they had changed the investigation, nor was it released if they uncovered anything. 
Two months before Wendy's disappearance, on March 25th, two sisters, 10-year-old Catherine Lyon and 12-year-old Sheila Lyon, walked to the Wheaton Plaza Mall near their home in Kensington, Maryland. When they failed to return home that night, a search was conducted and a witness came forward claiming to have seen them bound and gagged inside a car in Manassas, Virginia. Other witnesses claimed they had confronted a man at the mall who was staring at them or they were seen talking to a man outside the Orange Bowl restaurant. Also to note is that the Lyon family received a phone call demanding the same amount of money that the Eaton family had been demanded, but it was determined to be a hoax. The case would go cold and it would not be until it was reopened in 2013 that investigators got a suspect. Initially dismissed as just being after award money at the time, Lloyd Lee Welch was currently in jail for molesting a minor. He would confess that he had abducted the girls, but claimed he dropped them off at his father's property where he and his uncle raped, murdered, and burned the bodies. Minor traces of blood were discovered in the basement of the home in Hyattsville, Maryland, but it was too degraded to be tested. Police do believe there was a multiple person conspiracy in the murders, but with his father dead and no further evidence to incriminate his uncle, Richard Welch, only Lloyd was convicted of the murders, despite the bodies never being found. Edna Thorne was 15 years old when she left her family's home on Front Street to walk to a nearby relative's home on Tioga Street to see her new horse on June 24, 1975. After leaving the stables, she disappeared. Police doubted that Edna had run away and suspected her brother-in-law who allegedly had raped her and got her pregnant. The family would receive a series of disturbing phone calls after the disappearance from a man claiming to have buried her body in Pennypack Park, but if this is true, she has never been found. Just after 9 a.m. on Friday, August 15, 1975, eight-year-old Gretchen Harrington left her house to walk the few blocks to Trinity Chapel Christian Reformed Church for her Bible school. She had been doing this all week, but today was different. She never made it. 300 volunteers joined in the search for the girl, and dogs traced her scent, but it appeared she had gotten into a vehicle, and several people would say they saw a girl approaching a car with a man in it. It would be October 14th when a jogger at Ridley State Park noticed something in the woods. Gretchen's skeleton was found and pieces of her clothing were scattered in the surrounding 10 foot radius. An autopsy showed she had died from a blow to the head but could not tell if she had been raped. Though an anonymous letter in 1983 claimed to have evidence of her killer, her death remains unsolved. The final case is that of Cheryl Ann Moser. Four miles northwest of Tinicum Marsh in the Seacane neighborhood, 17-year-old Cheryl was walking to meet a friend when she vanished on July 12, 1977. Police received tips that she had also been killed by the warlocks and dumped in Tinicum Marsh, but Cheryl had no direct connections to any biker gangs. Her friend, however, was an associate with rival biker gang The Pagans, and Cheryl's then-boyfriend, David Thompson, would be convicted of participating in the beating death of a warlock gang member the following year. The three suicide cases would eventually be quietly closed again when investigators could find no evidence of foul play. But there was at least one strange fact. The autopsy on Givens would show that the bullet had entered through the top back of her head and that it was an extremely unusual trajectory for a self-inflicted wound. Oh, and the house Givens died at? Well, in a well-to-do neighborhood, warlocks and pagans were both seen regularly entering the home owned by Emil Greco Jr., along with a Rolls-Royce and limousine that were owned by Robert Anthony Marconi the man who owned the castle, a mansion built back in 1902. When Marconi purchased it, he turned the castle into a club where both warlocks and their rivals could set aside their differences to do drugs, party, and other nefarious things. The castle was well known to authorities, including the FBI, but Marconi was left largely alone because he had incriminating photos of many men in the department, as well as at least three federal judges. 
but nothing would be done until 1981 when the castle burned to the ground by some angry bikers. Investigators said that during their investigation, they were led time and time again back to the castle. Thomas Naus was known to frequent the place. He had also been convicted of at least one rape and beating. He would escape from prison in 1983 and would not be recaptured until 1990 after being profiled on Unsolved Mysteries and America's Most Wanted. Lots of people ride motorcycles, cops ride motorcycles, but the warlocks and other outlaw motorcycle gangs sometimes harbor dangerous criminals, even murderers. Robert Thomas Noss was one of these. This forensic bust of Robert Noss holds some clues. We'll share them with you and we'll meet one of the U.S. Marshals pursuing Bobby Noss when America's Most Wanted continues. Stay with us. Another prime suspect was Warlock member Stephen A. DeMarco, after police tied at least one of the girls to having been in his apartment. He would go to jail a number of times over the following decades for various crimes. Emil Greco would disappear September 1975 and has seemingly never been heard from again. Robert Marconi was eventually sent back to prison on drug charges, where he died of an aortic aneurysm at age 47 in 1992. The four girls are still on the books as being related cases. They are believed to have been killed for resisting rape by the gang. The deaths and disappearances of Wendy Eaton, Edna Thorne, and Gretchen Harrington are not officially linked to the other cases or amongst themselves. <laughs>